Two generations apart when an old soldier meets a young soldier. Let's go. We deployed in Iraq to Iraq in 2006. We then deployed to Kosovo. From there, we then deployed to uh, Afghanistan. Well, you've been through quite a lot, son, haven't you? Hi, nice Hello, you. young man. Nice to meet you. How are you? Pleasure. How have you been? You okay? Not so bad. You got to think about this. When I was in the Marine Corps, the Commandant was General Gray. General Gray was in the Korean War, the Vietnam War. So it's not that far removed from these guys. I remember clear as day talking to World War II vets. They were all over the place. You know, when I was a young kid, they were in their 50s and 60s. Great people to talk to. Completely different war, like he just said, than what we're used to. You sell? On the spot. On the spot. On the spot. There's a stack of mirrors, isn't there? Aye. Right. Which war did you fight in? Second World War. My fatella was the third fatella, and there was 12 of us, and we took part in the North African campaign, and then we went on to the invasion of Sicily. How long were you away for? Two years. In them days, it was a different war, yet they, you had to go over. Yeah, in those days, it wasn't a nine-month deployment or 13-month deployment. Come back, because the war was, we're going to keep staying there till we finish, right? It wasn't these never-ending wars like we've seen since Vietnam that go on for a decade. Completely different war, completely different philosophy. That part's very interesting. If these guys are around to talk to anymore, you should get their opinion. Where you were sent, and it, some lads went to North Africa and went right through and never got home till way after D-Day. The other wars that followed this, it, it's an entirely different war than what ours was. It go, I think it goes through generations, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. it, it goes from one war to another. It's frightening to see what happens to these modern wars. You're fighting an enemy, you do not know where he is. For the start, like in our war, as long as you were going forward, you were going the right way. But you get in Afghanistan and that, he, he can come up behind you and you don't know he's there. And from my way of thinking, I, I, I wouldn't like... Well, think about how this changed even since Desert Storm. And we went in, it was a big push, clear mission set, goals. Desert Shield, Desert Storm was very short in comparison to what we've been going through currently. It's like a Vietnam type war with no clear, distinct mission set, goals. Kind of get lost in the quagmire. That's what he's saying here. And it's these guys in today's generation have seen more combat than any generation almost combined the last three generations. I still fought in that war, I'll be honest with you. See, that's where I think the two changed because yeah, I wouldn't yeah. like to fight in your war because in my eyes, being on a ship... It's probably safer on a ship, so I can't swim, so... You can't swim? <laughs> but you're a sailor. And they never taught me, but where would you swim to? <laughs> if you're a long way from home, <laughs> don't matter whether you could swim or not. After training, I got to battalion. Um, and then we deployed to Belize. Yeah. We went for six weeks in the jungle, um, training. Yeah. And that was pre-training for Iraq. We deployed in Iraq to Iraq in 2006. Yeah, 2006. Yeah. That was a six. That sounds right. You go to training and you end up going to Belize, right? So you're doing jungle training and you end up going to the desert primarily. You know, some parts of Iraq, a little bit less desert. But it's interesting because pre- 9-11, pre the Gulf War, 1991, everything was woods and jungle, right? There's very little desert training, unless you went to 29 Palms or a tanker. Just didn't happen like it does today. So completely different set of facts than what people think about, especially young guys today. Six month tour, turned into a seven month tour. And we were deployed to uh, Saddam's Palace in Basra South, um, where we, we patrolled and did strike ops. Um, after there, we come back. I went on to do my promotion. Um, we then deployed to Kosovo, uh, that was for peacekeeping. And then from there, we then deployed to uh, Afghanistan, to Herak 10. Yeah. So completely different operations altogether from yeah. armoured to foot. Well, you've been through quite a lot, son, haven't you? What are your feelings towards the enemy now 
in comparison to at the time. <laughs> they couldn't that. At the time, I didn't. It's, it's weird because I'm going to probably stand out here. Is I didn't have any hate for them. I believed that we were fighting in someone else's country and they were defending it in a way. But I think that's one of the other reasons why I left because I, um, I didn't believe in it in the end. I think I. Most guys leave and they don't believe in the war at the end because the war kind of loses its goal. You've crossed the finish line or the touchdown goal line. You think, okay, we're done with this. We're going to be done. And all of a sudden it just keeps marching on and keeps rules of engagement change. You don't really see any clear end in sight. Guys get burned out, divorced, become alcoholics. You see quite a bit of that, but there's been no other time where guys have stayed in as long and fought as much. I can't stress that enough about this generation of you know, truly tested warriors, I'm sure just like this man here, that have been through more combat than anybody else. And I think that's often forgotten on this generation. I, I think I fought that hard and I was fighting an enemy so much that I was, I was equal to them. If someone can fight, if someone can get, get a number of men in front of me and fight me and my men to the, to the extreme that they were fighting us, then hat off to them. What about yourself? Well, <laughs> we fought the Germans to win the war. That, that's what was bred into you. And it took me until about 1970 before I could really, you know, see me way clear. I have nothing against them now. Now, my grandfather was in D-Day and the Battle of the Bulge in the Army. Did he talk about the war ever? No, I'd ask a little bit as a kid, but it wasn't as romanticized warfare as it is today, because we also had my uncle who got hurt during Vietnam permanently with a brain injury, left him in the hospital. My grandfather did have a thing against Germans. He wouldn't say it out loud, but he'd comment, and I remember thinking about it, and I suspect it's hard for these guys to let that go. You heard the younger guy say he didn't believe in the war. And, you know, if you ask him point blank, how do you feel about your enemy? I don't know if it'd be different than, say, this older fella. You guys let me know. I'm curious to see what your opinions are on that one. It took me all that time to realize they were the same as us doing what they had to do. Have you ever fired a weapon? Yes, sir. On the landing craft, I was an anti-aircraft gunner. Uh, we, we had six Orlikans and a 12-pounder on her. So uh, I fired that many times through the war. It's a different thing. It's, it's not like firing a rifle. No, no it, I, like a soldier has to rely on a rifle, doesn't he? Yeah. Like, oh, you have to rely on me. Anti-aircraft gun. Whenever you're in imminent danger, you call to action station. And if the planes come at you, then you have to fight back. And uh, on the Orlikin, you had a shield, which... Yeah, sitting on a ship, you're effectively a sitting duck, right? So back in those days, those guys on ships in particular, I know in the Pacific, you look at the kamikaze pilots, all the things that went on, they didn't have the radar, they didn't have the tech. It's just mind-boggling to think the last real air war, or really sea war we fought, probably been World War II. Korea was an air war, but we didn't have the sea warfare. This completely changed the magnitude of World War II. I don't know that the country could withstand that today. I think with these small skirmish type things or what's going to be in the future where you see these hot spots. But you see what's happened with the Rona. I don't know the country is willing to sacrifice whatever country you're in that global of a conflict or actual war. You, you look through the gap, so to speak. It always gave you that feeling that it couldn't hit you, but, which was a silly way of thinking, but it gave you a bit of feeling of comfort, if you know what I mean. See, with us, we were just rifles. We were just, well, rifles, um, and we had the uh, GPMGs, which was 762 belt fed, which that most of them- Well, you'd be lost just... without your rifle or your gun, wouldn't you? Yeah. On the deck. <laughs> Afghan had a section, so I had a section of eight lads, and very, very good lads as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, we would get in 360 ambushes, so we'd be... Real head-scratcher is you think we were fighting an enemy in World War II, Germans that were equally equipped, or some could say even better equipped.
you look at this war, we're fighting an enemy that's completely unequipped compared to us, technology-wise, air power, air superiority-wise. Now, they're not an army that you can identify by the clothes they wear, how they look. That's a big difference. It's more of a guerrilla tactics war, and the rules of engagement are completely different. A big part that people don't talk about is the press coverage and how that affects the sentiment back home, how we are as a people in the United States. It's a big difference. Basically, you would get hit by an IED, so you'd have someone from the front, yeah. right, left, they're coming from the top of the compounds, and they're basically just spraying you with rapid fire, with 762. Once you got into the firefight, you could never tell what was going to happen, but you always knew it was going to be like a well-oiled machine, the way your SOPs kick into place the way you, you, you know, your lads would, they just knew. Because of the amount of training you did, we, yeah. we knew exactly what we were doing. How do you think soldiers are viewed in society? It all depends how the media portrays us. I remember going back, when we were coming back from Iraq, uh, we landed in Teesside, and we had groups of people that weren't happy that we were there. And, that, they, and they were British people because the media portrayed us as killers, as murderers. Flipping the coin, when we come back from Afghan, we were portrayed as heroes. So the whole country rejoiced to go, oh, save our heroes. Obviously, you I really wish these people that stop at the, the ships are landing or at the airport who are bitching at the soldiers, go to parliament or go to the Congress and bitch at them the same way with the same fervor. They can't because Congress and the government's got security. Well, these guys have to take it. And I suspect this man here, the younger fella, would say, I thought I was doing the right thing. He got disenfranchised, loved his buddies, loved the camaraderie, hated the bullshit. And that's where this ends up, unfortunately, because the World War II vets, they had very little training comparatively. The amount of training, if you look at the boot camp, they were off. There wasn't as much training. And the Germans were a well-equipped army. Your generation, you were... Well, I heroes. think the war had lasted so long with our... that uh, they were glad to see the people back home. Yeah. And I think most soldiers and sailors, any serviceman, was looked upon, they, they say, hey, thank you to them yeah. for getting their freedom in one way. They were glad to see the war over. I can understand the difference now. Because yeah. It's a different generation. And yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it's a different war, isn't you, it? Well, you find it, I know. When you're in a war zone, and as you know, you've got that constant stress above your head of what's next, what's next, and you're constantly on high alert, and you're constantly high rate, high rate. it only takes one person to look at you, and you're ready to fight straight away. Hence why when, we come, when, we, when soldiers come back home, someone looks at you the wrong way, you're already in fight mode. It's been 12 years, I'm still... Now, I can tell you, speaking with my grandfather, he said after World War II, when he came back home in 1945, he said before the war, the bars were empty. He said after the war, the bars were full. He didn't make any statement as to why. As a kid, I remember hearing that. I thought, huh, interesting. You know, it was called shell shock back then. There wasn't a PTSD. I don't know if that changed the complexion of society. As we know it, you know, we had World War I. You don't hear about that as much with respect to PTSD or World War II. And even in Vietnam, it really started where you heard about people becoming addicted to things, but it was always blamed on something else. Now we've recognized it, but I don't know that we've really figured out a way to, to fix the problem, right? We've glamorized a situation like this man's going through where he's in combat so long I'm not sure you could ever fix that, get him back to where he started. Still in fight mode now. I don't think I'll ever change, I'll, I'll ever change that. If you're fighting a war, it's him or us, so to well, speak. That's and that's my way of thinking. Yeah. And so let it be. That's it. But when I was out there, it was my lads. My lads are coming home, no matter what. I don't care who you are, my lads are coming home. Have you ever left, lost a member of your company? It's a, yeah, I want to answer it, but I don't at the same time because we've lost quite a, quite a lot of lads yeah. from, our, from, our, from our battalion, from our regiment. I'll say, I'll, say, I'll say regiment because 
is one RGJ and two RGJ. Today is the 10th, the 10th anniversary for a lad we lost called uh, Paul McAleese. He was my screw, we, you know, we, uh, we, we lost him 10 years today. Um, we lost. I found after being in the military and I had friends that were in during Desert Storm, they were in during 2003 in the first big push. They got out, say, 2010. Found more guys that have died from suicide or addiction problems than actual combat. I'm not saying I have an answer. We really need to have the politicians think about this because this young guy here, he looks troubled like he's really, these are tough questions for him, and I understand why. And hopefully we do something as a group, as society, and you guys watching the big part of this, beyond just placate these guys and talk about it, thank you for your service, that we really think about sending people off to warfare before we do it, because the cost can affect a whole generation of people. We've lost quite a lot, yeah. I think I'll leave, I think I'll leave it there. I like, don't want to go too, too much into it. Like. Have you ever suffered a serious injury? I've only had a a back flash from the gun, which sometimes with an orlikin, after it gets hot, thing sort of blows and you get a flash, yeah, but uh, nothing uh, serious. Uh. Apart from like a few broken like sprains and broken yeah. wrists and stuff like that, and a major one would be probably mental, mentally. And this is, this is, as you know, it's a massive epidemic that's going through the military at the moment for veterans and for still serving is mental health. The past 13 years I've really suffered, like really, really suffered. Oh, yeah. But I've sort of like battered it backwards, battered it backwards and kept moving forward, you know what I mean? Yeah. It was kept, kept yeah. moving forward. And I think we I have to say, this guy's choking me up. We're just watching this. I feel bad for the guy because I truly can see it in his face that he's suffering. And I've known guys like this I found the best medicine, you know, I've talked to friends. I know my experience is completely different. I wasn't in during this time and these wars. Is staying busy is key, but sometimes it's hard, right? You get back to the, your friends or the guys you were in with. You can get around some negative people that can affect you. Sometimes you just can't win the battle. You know, he's saying he's had depression and stress. And that's something some people just cannot get out of the hole. There's nothing you can do but try to stay busy and move forward. And these guys have accomplished so much, and I think they need to realize that and be told that, and not from the VA or from some government person, but their other friends and their family members, maybe somebody who's been there, maybe older veterans, to say, you guys have done a lot. You should be very proud of yourselves. That's what needs to be said, because I, you know, anytime I get a chance to talk to someone who's been in, you know, it's a very impressive group of men. And ladies, I mean, it's hard to take away from anything these guys have accomplished. With my age now, I've got, I've got to the age where it's like, well, I've got my family and all that. It's yeah. like, I've got to stay straight, you know what I mean? But it does, it creeps I back a lot. It does creep back a lot. I think having my daughter is kicking up the arse quite hard, like, you know what I mean? But I think if, if it didn't, I'd probably still yeah. be like that, you know what I mean? It's, uh, but I know a lot of lads, a lot of girls, yeah. a, lot of, a, lot, a lot of soldiers yeah. are suffering. Do you miss the forces? Oof, that's a good question. No, I don't think I missed it. I was away about four and a half years I served, and I was glad to get out. And no, that's my answer. Before he finishes that statement, let's talk about he got out. A really key element here is when you get out of the military, you really got to have a plan to keep you busy. Now, let's say you got it and the plan's going well all of a sudden, 20 years later, and I've known this from friends, they were busy raising families, paying off things, getting a good job, and all of a sudden the music stops. Then what? They don't have, they're not the warrior anymore, they're not the family man anymore because their family's grown. Now all of a sudden they're stuck with the things they have to think about in their head, and that's dangerous. It's a real dangerous thing, and hopefully he's addressing it because there's no end in sight the amount of battles we're going to have to face in the future based on our current climate we're in. Answer to that, I don't know about yourself. No. A lot of the lads, their issue with it, they say, oh yeah, I missed the army, I wish I'd go back. I think what it is, is, is regimented. The regimented in a, such a routine where that is your life and you do that for three to seven to 22 years. Well, I left 
and it was like, oh, I'm struggling here. But it was because it was the unknown. It's, uh, I don't miss it. I miss the lads and the I miss- The camaraderie. Yeah, I miss That's that. That's about the only thing you miss. Yeah. Yeah, when people asked about it, it took me about a good five years after getting out to adjust, because you go in at such a young age, very intense in your mind as a young person. I don't know how long he was in, but the camaraderie, the friendship, you know what the plan is. If you don't like it, but at least you know what it is. You get out in the civilian world and you're like a ship without a rudder, unless you get a plan. It's very easy to get around some negative people and feel kind of get down on yourself. I've seen that with a lot of guys that were in this war. And, you know, you've seen it with the Vietnam era guys, you know, in a completely different set of circumstances, but the same outcome. Yeah. Well, oh, don't get me wrong, I miss firefights, believe it or not. I miss getting into firefights. I miss weapon handling. I miss teaching it, but that can be replaced by anything. You know what I mean? If you find an, another passion and another love in life, you replace it with that, you know what I mean? Is there anything you regret about your service? Not really, yeah. Uh... Through the, well, through the years, I, I, I am proud to have been a part of it. It took all my youth. If I hadn't have been there, I'd have missed quite a lot. And no, I don't regret it one half of I don't think I regret it because it's like, well, like I said, it's what I've gained from it. I mean, mentally, it's, it's been mentally draining once I've got out, but at the same time, it's strengthening at the same time. So where something's suffering, Someone else is strengthening, you know what I mean? So I'm, I'm becoming a better person. You gotta find the good takeaways. You gotta find the good parts of it. Because there's always gonna be negative shit. There's always gonna be terrible things that happen. But you can take, in this guy's case, what he did, all the things he accomplished at his very young age, say, what am I gonna do with that? I've got a good foundation to work from. I may have some mental things going on, Got to figure out how to deal with it. But things they've accomplished that they just take for granted is significant. In the civilian world, people just, sh they don't get it. And they're not going to get it. You got to say, I'm better than these people. I can do more. I'm harder. I can work longer and win. <laughs> well, you want to tell your story. From my point of view, it may be to help the younger generation they don't know about your war. They don't know about my war. And by coming on this sort of thing, people watch it and they realize it's part of history. I would think so, or I hope so. Well, with me, it's like for 10 years after getting out, I, I, I suffered and I went into a dark place and I kept it to myself. And when, every time someone mentioned the military or something, my dad switch off and walk away. They want to know. And I'm still a little bit like that now. But since I've well, since this year, I've started a new project. I've been talking about my career and my uh, story, my mental health and my, my fight and struggle and all, all that carry on. It's, it's I've known some guys over the years, in particular, significant career guys who got out, did some contracting, did other types of work, and they never once talked about their time in service. I never asked. I never thought to ask because... Why would I? If they want to talk about it, they would, but they just wanted to keep it close to the vest. They were very proud men. They didn't want to feel like they were complainers or act like they were complainers. And they never bragged about anything. If you found it out, you found it out, unfortunately, a lot of times at a funeral. It's actually helping me. It's helping me talking about it. More importantly, the couple of someone sat in a dark room right now who hasn't left the house for two weeks. And they're, just, they're scrolling the phone, they come, they come across Lad Bible, they watch, they listen to this, they listen to me and you, and they go, I've been through that. I've seen this, or that's worse than me, or that's not as worse than me. And they, they, if they stand up and they walk out the front door and they give it a go, then we save one, then it's worth it. So that, that's why I talk about my story now. And well, I wouldn't have known your story if I hadn't have listened to it here, would I? I've learned a lot from you, and I hope our little talk today has helped in that I way. I think it will. Not just For you veterans out there, people that weren't in but have a veteran in your family, the best thing we can do is try to help them. And I'd say thank you for your service, but give them another mission to take care of in life. Because when you get out, when you're so young and regimented, his case, he's got PTSD, 
and how his brain processes trauma he saw is a very hard thing for us to figure out. All we can do is support them. And remember this in the future, when people want to send young men and women off to fight, this can be the outcome.